Today, Pastor David continues our series entitled, Now What? As followers of Christ, we are empowered to be His witnesses. Don't let the reasons you think you can outweigh the opportunities all around you. Take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's worship. I don't leave a lot of Google or reviews. I don't leave a lot of reviews, period. I've left, I think, two. In, uh, uh, but, but we do think reviews are helpful. We use reviews quite often. We don't go anywhere where there's how to eat, vacation, stay anywhere, uh, at a hotel or uh, VRBO, any of those places. We don't, without reading the view, reviews first, right? We, we want to read the reviews. They're helpful. I did post one review, though, that, uh, that I keep getting emails about that tells me that review has been helpful to people. And I just think, man, look at me being a good citizen, right? I mean, that's just all awesome that I get to help people. I, here's my review. I brought it just so you can see, just in case you care. Uh, it was on vacation in Tennessee uh, one time, and this place, we needed new tires, and this place was so great and helped us out. So I'm just glad. So I just want to encourage you, if you want to leave a rave positive review for us here at Bethel, you can do that. You can go on to Google, Yelp, Facebook, any of your favorite tools, and give us a great review. Anyway, um, Reviews are helpful, right? You think about it. You go anywhere and you, or do anything, you want to tell people about how you enjoyed that thing, right? If you go stay somewhere, you go eat somewhere, and, it, and you enjoy that place, you want to let people know how much you enjoyed the place that you went to, right? I love when we go out to eat. Jenny's eating some food, and she tells me, this is so good. You should try this. Yes. Right? Because now I don't have just my food. I have her food as well, because she's sharing her food with me. I can't say that I'm the same. Javen doesn't share food, right? So this is just like uh, the, that thing. Jenny is a better food evangelist than I am, all right? She's, she's way better at that. But if, if we want to use biblical terminology, that's exactly what we are. We are evangelists for the things that we enjoy, right? We share the news of what that has meant to us. Well, this is what we've been called to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ and with our faith. Our opening text that Hank read for us, this is what Paul is telling us, that we are to be ministers of reconciliation, meaning that we are to do everything we can to lead people to see their lives restored in right relationship with our creator God, our heavenly father. And we do that by witnessing. This is what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks in the series that, that we've been in. We, we, we started off looking at Acts chapter 1 where Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, he, he gathers his disciples around and he tells them, I need you guys to go pray and, and, and you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be my what? Witnesses is what he told them. To be my witnesses. That's why the Holy Spirit is going to empower you and you're going to take what you know about me and you're going to take it into, into the, your hometown and to regions beyond. Everywhere that you have the opportunity to go, you're going to express what you have in me. And so what happened is the event that we call Easter birthed what we call the church. And it's a movement. It's a movement that's still going on. And this movement is captured, we said, by the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's captured by his death and by his resurrection. And, and, and that is the center of our life. And our life is built upon that. Our faith is built upon that. But not only is our life captured by that message, we are yielded, as a part of that movement, we are yielded to the Holy Spirit of God that empowers us. And we need that empowerment. Because as we looked last week, we said we live in a world that by nature, the spirit of this world is opposed to God. It's opposed to anything about Jesus Christ. It's opposed to, the, to faith centered in Christ with relationship with God. But Jesus told us that, uh, that his spirit is within us to help us to testify with the spirit about who Jesus is. It's in us to give us boldness. We've looked at the early church and the boldness that they had to express their faith in Jesus Christ. And we need that in a world that's opposed to it. And it's not always easy. And sometimes we feel pressure around us and pushing against us. But we said that when we feel that pressure, what's inside that, that comes out is important. The, the Holy Spirit gifts, uh, gives us gifts to work through us. But what comes out of us should be the fruit of the Spirit, Right? And we said we can express our convictions and our faith in a way that is meek and humble and merciful and genuine and friendly. And we have to do this because we live in a world that Jesus defines those without him, those without a relationship with Christ, a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. 
He defines them using three words. Lost, blind, and dead. Lost, blind. Now, if you hear that, you may think, well, that's kind of offensive. But we have to understand, we are more than just the physical body that we have right now. We're a soul. And without a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, we are lost, we are blind, and we are dead. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Look at, look at what, he, what he says here. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are what? Lost. And then he goes in and he gives multiple parables and illustrations and, exa- and stories and examples of people who had lost things that were valuable and what they did to find those things and how important it is to find the things that are lost that are valuable to us. And Jesus said, those without him are lost. Look at John chapter 9, verse 39. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, to show those who think they see that they are blind. So he's come to give sight to the, those who are spiritually blind and the ones that think they're not, those who are extremely religious, to show them that they are actually blind because they're more focused on their rules than they are their God. And because five times in Matthew chapter 23, we see that Jesus calls the Pharisees blind and blind gods. Five different times he calls them that. So we're lost without Christ. We're blind. And then we see this in John chapter 5, verse 24, 25. He says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. He says, they will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from what? From death into life. How do we go from death to life? By believing in Christ. Paul wrote about it this way when he wrote his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter two, verse four. He said, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Without Christ, we are lost. We are blind and we are dead. And our hearts as followers of Christ should break for people that we know who are outside of a relationship with God because that's the nature of their soul. And I hope if if you're here today and you don't have that relationship with God, you're not offended by those statements from Jesus, but instead you begin to do some introspection and think to yourself, am I really lost, blind? And am I? I dead on the inside without him. But we have to be moved, like we said last week, with compassion and moved to want to do something, moved to want to tell others about our faith in Christ. But let's be honest with ourselves. We make a lot of excuses for why it's not that easy to talk about our faith. And maybe you don't like the word excuses. I get that. We use a lot of reasons. Reasons can be a more gentler word sometimes, right? We'll have reasons why it's not so easy. And for some, some do have a gift to just be able to do it, to just be able to start talking about their faith, captivate people through their conversation. They just have that gift, you know? And and there is scripturally a gift through the Holy Spirit to evangelize, to be an evangelist. It's actually one of the fivefold gifts to the church that the church builds, uh, builds upon. It is a gift. But just because we may not have the gift of an evangelist, we all have the call to be witnesses of the good news of Jesus Christ, witnesses of our faith. We are all called to the ministry of reconciliation. I remember when when I was youth pastor, I had this young lady in the youth, an incredible young lady, intelligent, asked a lot of questions. In fact, she called me this week asking me a question about about some things. And it's just so great to, to, to continue to have conversations like that. But I'll never forget one night we had had an event and we're doing stuff, cleaning up, taking care of things. And I asked her, this was not sexist. It was not, she was closest to it. So I just asked her to do it. I said, there's a vacuum right there. Will you grab that and start vacuuming this area so we can get out of here while others are doing some other things. And she made the same, she was just being funny, but she made the same and she said, well, this isn't really my gifting. I'm not gifted in vacuuming. <laughs> I said, you're funny. You're funny. I get it. Okay. You, uh, well, you may not be gifted in it, but right now that's your call. So work in your calling and do the vacuuming that you're called to do right now, all right? We may not all be gifted, but we're all called, right? We're all called. Because, see, once we begin to understand the depths of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, 
We should want to express that with others. I'm just going to share some stories with you from the Gospels today. In Luke chapter 7, verse, uh, you find it in verses 36 to 50. It tells us about this, this woman. that Jesus is at a Pharisee's house. And you, you may have heard this story, read this story before. He's at a Pharisee's house, and this woman comes into the house while Jesus is there. And this woman is an immoral woman. She is known for her immorality. And she comes in with this jar of perfume. And she takes this expensive jar of perfume, which she's probably bought through her immorality. She takes this expensive jar of perfume. She breaks it. And she's pouring it on Jesus' feet. Her tears, she's weeping. She's crying over Jesus' feet. And Luke tells us she's drying his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees are in this house. They're looking at this going on. And they are so consumed with the fact that Jesus is allowing such a sinful woman to touch his feet that they're missing the fact that an extremely sinful woman is broken over her sin. All they can see is her uncleanliness. And they're missing the grace and the mercy of God. This is what's been happening their whole time. They're so caught up in their religiosity that they are missing the grace and the mercy of God. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to tell them a story about these two guys that had debt. Debt from this one individual. One's debt was more than the others, but that one individual forgave both of these men's debts. And then Jesus asked them, he says, who do you think loved the man that forgave their debt the most? Of course, the Pharisees are smart, so they answer, well, the one who was forgiven the most. And then Jesus says, you're right. And then he makes this statement and he teaches them a lesson. Luke chapter seven, verse 47, we see it. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. A person who is forgiven little shows only little love. I wanna give you another way to understand what Jesus is saying. I'm not, I'm not adding, I don't believe I'm adding to what he's saying. When we understand the depths to which Jesus goes to forgive our life and free us from the penalty of sin, we respond to that forgiveness in an incredible way. We may not all be forgiven of the same amount of sin, but we're all forgiven from the same penalty of sin. We're all forgiven from the same death and brought to life. Throughout the Gospels, in in the birth of the early church, we see people who encounter Jesus, encounter Jesus through his disciples, encounter the Holy Spirit, and when they encounter him, they go back, and what do they do? They begin to talk about it. Even if they're told, now don't tell anybody about this, they go back and they talk about it. They talk about it to their family. They talk about it to their friends. They talk about it to their community. They tell everybody. And it's never about whether or not they have the gift to go back and do it. It's never whether or not about they have the intellect to be able to talk about it intelligently enough. Everything they're doing, it's all about who they just met. One of my favorite encounters is with a blind man. This encounter Jesus has with a blind man. You see this in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 34. I love this encounter. Jesus comes across this blind man, and he restores his sight. But the way he does it, right? Maybe you know this. He gets the dust, picks up dirt from the ground, he spits in it, and he makes mud. And, and, and a lot of times we read that and we're like, that is so disgusting. Like, why, why would Jesus do that? But think about this. There's so many people that say Jesus never expressed his deity, never expressed that he was God. But that's wrong. He did. I mean, you read the Gospels, you see him express his deity. You read the Gospel of John seven different times, he calls himself the I am. I mean, he expresses his deity over and over. But this is one of those times where he visually demonstrates his deity. Because even if you don't know the Bible, you've probably heard of creationism. How, how the earth was created and creationists believe that God created the earth, right? And if you know creationism, then you know that Creationists believe that man was created by God and God formed man from the what? The dust of the ground. 
So in this moment, Jesus picks up the dust of the ground and he visually demonstrates John's words. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jesus Christ is that word. He visually demonstrates what Paul would go on to write and say that he was there in the beginning and everything that was made was made by him and was made for him. He takes the dust of the ground and he molds it and he creates sight in this man. And this guy goes and he begins to tell everybody what's happening and people don't believe that it's him. They think this is a different guy. And he's like, no, it's me, it's me. So this causes a stir again with all the Pharisees and they're like, this can't be happening. And so they go, they're having this conversation with this man. They're talking to him about what's happening and they think, they begin to think, you were never really blind. You were only saying you were blind so that you could beg and you can get money off the street. They call the man's parents in and they say, hey, he was never really blind, was he? Come on, you can confess. You're not gonna be in trouble. You can confess. He was never really blind. They say, no, he was blind. He was born blind. He could not see. And so they're asking, well, how can he see now? And they're like, well, we can't tell his story. He has to tell his story. And they said, we'll bring him back in. So they're asking him more and more questions. And Pharisees are getting frustrated. And it seems, the way I read it, the blind man's getting frustrated. They keep asking the questions. And they're saying, they're, they're calling, Pharisees are calling Jesus a sinner. But I love his response. This is such a lesson to us. John chapter 9, verse 25, he says, I don't know three incredibly powerful words that it is okay for you to say sometimes. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. We can find it together. I don't know. He says, I don't know whether he's a sinner the way you profess he is. He said, but I do know this. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you this. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was this, but now I'm not. And he goes on and and. And they say, but what did he do? They ask, how did he heal you? And this is where we kind of see his frustration. Look, the man exclaimed, I've told you once. Did you not? This is boldness, guys, because he's talking to the saying, this is, he says, did you not listen? Why, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> to which my thought in, in the world I live in and my thinking, I go, this is the, the reaction of the crowd looks something like this. Like, that's everybody's reaction right there. Like, ho, 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 you know? It's not about how gifted you are. It's not about the gifting that you might have. It's not about your level of biblical knowledge. It's about Jesus and your life in him and his Holy Spirit working through you. That's what it's about. You know, we keep going in the history of the church and we see that God used an incredi incredibly biblically knowledgeable man, a guy that was proficient in Jewish law, in Jewish history, in Jewish literature. The man's name was Saul, but he had an encounter with a resurrected Jesus Christ and his life completely changed. And he began to follow him. He became known as Paul. And God used him through the power of the Holy Spirit to change people's lives. He used a gruff and rough and impulsive fisherman by the name of Peter to be a part of the birth of the early church, to preach the first gospel message to see 3,000 people repent and give their life to Christ through the message that was spoken by Paul, God worked in a businesswoman's life by the name of Lydia and used her to birth a church. He works through so many different people. We referenced last week, these last couple of weeks, the passages of Acts chapter three and Acts chapter four when, when Peter and John were, were preaching the good news of Jesus and they were arrested and they were put in prison for it and they went before the Sanhedrin. We said the Sanhedrin was amazed do you remember what they were amazed by? Maybe you remember that they were amazed that these are uneducated in the way that they were educated. Maybe you remember, well, they were amazed because these guys are acting just like the Jesus that we've already killed and apparently we didn't kill the movement like we thought. 
But what were they, this is what they were amazed by. This is what Luke tells us they were amazed by. Acts chapter four, verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. The boldness. Are people amazed by our boldness? Are they amazed by the boldness we have from the Holy Spirit? And so what do we say happened? We talked about it last week. They were threatened by them. They were told, don't you do this anymore. So they went back to the homes and they prayed together with their fellow believers. And what did they pray? They said, God, give us more boldness to continue talking about you. And they went out and they kept preaching and they kept teaching. Well, what happens after that? You go into the very next chapter. We see that they're out there. They're preaching and talking about Jesus again. They get arrested again. They get put in prison. And this time while they're in prison, an angel comes in there, Luke tells us, and busts them out of prison. Only time it's okay to break out of jail is if an angel breaks you out of jail, all right? Just, all right? And the angel busts them out and tells them, go back to the temple and go talk about Jesus some more. So they go back to the temple and they talk about Jesus. They get arrested again. And the, this time, the Sanhedrin brings them out, and look what happens, Acts chapter 5, verse 40. The others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles, and they had them flogged. Stop right there, because we cannot just read that and move on. We have to understand what's happened here. To flog, the word flogging literally means to flay, to remove skin. These were whippings. They were beatings. They were thrashings. They were done in a calculated way to not kill someone, but to injure them badly. That's why we see Paul reference several times. He said, I had the 40 lashings minus one. So apparently 39 was the magical number that they knew we can beat them that much and not kill them. These guys were flogged, beaten, their skin opened, not in just a little scar, but violently opened. And what do they do? Let's keep reading. They ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus. They let them go. They must be going to keep quiet, right? The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And then every day, in the temple and from house to house they continued to preach this message Jesus is the Messiah why was that message important because those people didn't believe he was the Messiah every day it didn't matter that they had just been beaten almost to death knowing that it could happen again and knowing that the next phase could happen, death. Every day they went out. They rejoiced and they kept talking about it. That's boldness. And think about this. We worry whether or not we're going to offend someone by talking about our faith. We worry whether or not we're going to make somebody a little uncomfortable because we talk about the fact that we have faith in Christ. We worry about whether or not we're going to say the right thing. God help us to believe deeply and speak boldly. A timid and fearful faith does not reach a lost and broken world. God help us to believe deeply and speak boldly. What we fear controls us, right? What we fear controls us. You know, I have a couple of fears in my life. I'll tell you this one because I know you can't bring this and put it in my office. I don't like sharks. I am afraid of sharks because I, my wife loves movies about sharks and shows about sharks. I tell her she's deeply disturbed, and I pray for her often. But the last time I checked, sharks live in the ocean, right? I mean, and, I, and some of you people, you fish from the very sand that I want to get in there and swim in, Right? And you're just drawing them things to me. We were one ocean one time, and we were out there in the water, and some people came up to fish, and I was very Christ-like in that moment. I just started jumping and splashing very loudly in the water. They moved down a little bit. 
I, I'm a, I don't like sharks because last time I checked, they can eat you, right? So that controls how I enjoy the ocean. What we fear controls us. That's why over and over throughout Scripture, we see God encouraging us, encouraging us fear God. Fear God. Because the more you fear God in your life, the more he will lead your life. The more he will direct your life. And the more you will know and the more you will understand, you have what it takes to share your faith. It's not about making time to share your faith. It's about making your faith the center of your life and then allowing that everything that you, allowing every aspect of your normal life to be lived with gospel intentionality. Where you just live in a way that you, you want to follow God and honor God and then when the opportunity arises, you can talk about God. It's not about whether or not you have the ability to share your faith. Have you ever wondered why there's never really a step-by-step technique pattern in the Gospels and in the, in the New Testament to show you how to talk about your faith? Jesus doesn't sit down with his disciples and say, okay, here's step one through five on how to tell others about your faith. We don't see the apostles do that in the New Testament in their letters that they write. We don't see them because it's not really about a technique problem. It's more about an apathy problem. It's just about sharing your story related to the gospel story. You may not have all the answers, and that's okay. It's, a, it, it's about you have the words, right? Use the words you have about the truth you know. I, I, I don't know that, but I know this. I know that I once was this, but now I'm this. Use the words words you have about the truth you know and let your life demonstrate the truth it's a both end and listen I want to tell you something that will free you a little bit because too often we think that well I don't want to share my faith because I've shared my faith before and I've never seen anything happen in someone's life Paul tells us this 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7 just look at his words he says it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering What's important is God makes the seed grow. So here's the thing. You may just plant. And you may be watering. What's important is that we just obey and trust. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you in some way to talk about your faith, to share your faith, then he has been preparing that heart to receive it. We just obey and we trust. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, the Holy Spirit will move them by first moving you. In other words, you, they may not ever actually step out in action until you step out in action. Again, one last story from the Gospels. Quick encounter. These two guys, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, we see this. These two guys had been around in Jerusalem. They had seen all this stuff going on with Jesus, the Nazarene. They're walking back to their hometown, Emmaus. Emmaus is seven miles from Jerusalem, and they're on this seven-mile journey. They're talking about all that's been happening with this Jesus of the, the Nazarene and this, this death, and, and now how people are talking about he's resurrected. And then all of a sudden, this guy joins them on their walk, and he begins to talk to them, and they become captivated by the words he's saying in the, in the conversation that they're, they're having. And, and it tells us that he tells them, I've got to leave. And they say, no, eat dinner with us, eat with us. And so Jesus sits down to eat with them. And when he breaks bread, it says all of a sudden their eyes are open and they realize this is Jesus. This is Jesus. I heard a pastor by the name of Judah Smith. He's a pastor in, in Seattle, Washington. He made this statement from this story one time. He said, sometimes it takes a seven mile walk instead of a seven second talk before someone realizes the beauty of Jesus. In other words, sometimes we think, well, if we just have this quick conversation, then bam, all of a sudden that's gonna happen. And that might happen, but sometimes it's a journey. Sometimes it's a process. In fact, it might've been a process for you. It might've been a journey for you. That's why we thank God in his, that he is patient with us. You have what it takes because you have the Holy Spirit. And yes, there might be times when it feels a little weird, but isn't the message important enough 
to be worth a little bit of weirdness. And yes, sometimes you might be rejected and nobody wants to talk about that. They don't want to hear about it. Yes, they might talk about you. But remember the words of Jesus, blessed are you when you're insulted. Because a reward awaits you in heaven because of your faith. But I, we say this over and over. We have to understand that our scrutiny here is way different than the scrutiny our brothers and sisters face on the other side of the world. Our pride makes our scrutiny greater than what it actually is. The bottom line is you never fail when you share your faith about Christ. We only fail when we don't. But we don't have to live in that failure. We have to realize there's another opportunity. Take the next opportunity. How moved are you? people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people in your family, the people in your community, how moved are you for them? As if you're followers of Christ, if we are followers of Christ and we believe this is the word of God, that it is true, if we believe that Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, the one who has no rival, if we believe he has no equal, if we believe he is greater than anything and everything in this world, if we believe that, if that is the foundation of our faith, we must be burdened to share our faith. And just imagine, just imagine if you're willing to talk about what Christ has done in your life, what your faith means to you. Imagine the difference it can make in someone's life. Imagine the homes that can be changed, the families that can be changed. Imagine the classrooms that can be changed, the work environments that can be changed, the communities that can be changed, the churches that can be, church buildings that can be filled. Imagine what can take place when we're willing to express our faith, to be bold and allow the Spirit to work through us. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find a link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803 803- 676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.